right. Uh, so firstly, thanks very much to the organizers for inviting me. It's a real privilege to have the opportunity to present here. Um, and thanks to everyone for, for coming. Um, so yeah, today I'll be talking about kind of statistical and then computational or algorithmic perspectives of randomized sketching algorithms. So in particular, I'll be kind of trying to sort of unify or explain sort of two different perspectives of, of sketching, which, uh, which I'll introduce. So kind of the, the broad focus of this, this workshop is the idea of kind of when you have large scale data problems in kind of machine learning or statistics or optimization or computer science, you kind of are looking at you know, either statistical or computational or sort of both perspectives of that. And that's sort of a real issue in many kind of modern large scale data problems. And so kind of in an ideal world, what you, what you really want uh, is something that you know, has, is something that you can, you know, is computationally feasible that you, know, you can run on sort of whatever computational resources you have available. Um, but then it also has kind of good performance you know, in some statistical or other, other metric that, that you might be interested in. And so, I mean, there's many different ways that people have done that, and we've had you know, a few different approaches uh, in this workshop, and we will hear, hear more today. But one approach that's kind of received uh, a, a, a fair amount of attention in the last sort of five to 10 years is this notion of sketching. And also, I'll define what that precisely means in the context of the problem that I talk about. But what kind of sketching refers to is if you have very large scale data, so at a high level, you have very, very large scale data, if you kind of you know, sketch or project it onto something low dimensional and then run whatever algorithm you're going to run on the large data set, but on now this sketched or smaller data set, that then you kind of will, you know, that that's one way to certainly improve, like reduce computation because you've reduced the size of your data. And ideally you sort of have not lost too much for computation from a, from a statistical or, you know, accuracy perspective. Um, and so, I mean, there's, you know, like, how you do the sketching is sort of, it depends on the, on the problem. And, but there has been, and this is a very, very sparse sampling of the sketching literature. There's been lots and lots of other work done, but here are just a few relevant examples. But if you do particularly like, you know, things like randomized projections or subsampling, there are some results to show that, you know, in some sense you, you gain computationally because you've re reduced the data size and run your algorithm on a much smaller data set, but then also potentially not lost too much in terms of, in terms of accuracy. Um, and this is sort of broadly based on, you know, ideas due to like kind of Johnston, the Johnston Linden Strauss lemma for dimension reduction and then like concentration of measure. But in particular for ordinarily squares, which is what I'll be talking about today, um, there's some results, you know, to show that, you know, you potentially don't lose much uh, computationally. Um, there's also some work related to the CUR decomposition. Uh, so that's kind of a, trying to do like SVD type decom uh, decompositions or, you know, you know, multi or, or you know, some kind of uh, low dimensional reduction techniques, but using kind of, you know, random projections to speed up computation. And there's also been this kind of line of work on kind of iterative sketching um, for kind of, you know, if you want to solve linear systems using spectral sparsification. So here are just a couple of examples where this idea of sketching where reducing the data size is potentially, you know, going to sort of allow us to do, you know, faster computations for, uh, for things without losing too much. So um, I guess just to sort of explain the genesis of, the, of this problem. So in some ways, like there's, there's two sort of perspectives of this. So there's like a lot of the work that's been done on sketching um, sort of prior to this has largely been, I would say more in the applied maths, theoretical computer science literature. And so I'm kind of describing this as the algorithmic or computational perspective of sketching. So people like Michael Mahoney, Dan Spielman and others have kind of worked on, worked on this a lot. And, the, the general principle of it is that, you know, by doing sketching, you still get sort of close to optimal worst case error bounds. And I'll kind of define what that means for this particular problem, um, even, even by doing sketching. So you're kind of, you know, gain, so, so you're, you're gaining a lot computationally and basically not losing much from an accuracy perspective. And there's like some kind of results that, that sort of support this. But sort of I, you know, I'm sort of originally, you know, trained in statistics and kind of used to thinking about things in a statistical way. And so when I think about sort of the sketching, you know, the sketching type methods that uh, that are being talked about in the literature here, that in some sense you're throwing away a lot of your data. So, and I'll talk about exactly how much for the problem that that I'll be focusing on. But um, like, and this is a lot, like more than half your data basically, and. In some sense, what, what, what these results are saying is that you're not losing much by kind of throwing away a lot of your data. So this didn't really sort of make much sense to me because obviously if you have more data, you're going to, 
you know, if, if you have like less than half your data, you should be losing a lot of it. And so this was something that at, at, at some level when I started working on this problem in early 2013, I sort of didn't really understand, you know, why you were, you were gaining something. So in, in, or why you were not losing too much. And so the goal of this talk is basically to kind of unify these, these two perspectives. So essentially kind of I, I sort of ran into Michael, I, I guess, at, at a conference at the beginning of 2013 and sort of having read some of this, you know, this, this work on sketching, I sort of didn't really understand exactly sort of how, you know, you were not losing too much. Um, and we'll see that the answer to that in the context of this ordinary least squares um, or regression type problem is that it's just that sort of it's, it's we're coming at it from from a couple of from two different perspectives. So we had a sort of a lot of long discussions and arguments about this, and I guess eventually we just decided to sort of resolve by just writing a paper together, which I'll which I'll talk about. So just to sort of be concrete about the problem that I'm looking at, and so this is kind of the simplest problem that you know you can think of, but it's still sort of very widely used. It's this you know notion of you're doing least squares for large scale problems and analogously just solving large-scale linear systems. Uh, so if we think about ordinary least squares, you have you know, two things, your data, like your x and your y. So x is an n by p matrix, and y is an n-dimensional vector. Uh, and to, be, to make things concrete, we're assuming that both n and p are extremely large, but n's much, much larger than p. Um, and for simplicity and without loss of generality, we're assuming that the rank of x is just p. So you can kind of you know, easily apply this if you have lower rank structure, but we're going to assume for simplicity that, that the rank of x equals p. And so you know, we all sort of know how to solve the ordinary least squares uh, problem. So um, you know, this, is, and, and this is something that can be done, but obviously the, the computational cost of that is order of np squared, which is you know, perfectly reasonable in, in many cases. But when, you have, when you're in the extremely large-scale large, large scale data setting, uh, this is, you know, potentially, you know, not not feasible, and particularly, you know, if you're doing least squares iteratively, you, in some sense, ideally would want to sort of potentially reduce this computation, and, you know. So although this is sort of a very simple problem that, you know, in some sense you would think is more or less solved, as as has kind of been described in lots of earlier talks. So Alex touched upon this in his talk, and then Vinay mentioned this that, in some sense, a lot of problems reduced to sort of solving the least squares problem. So any gains you can get computationally to, to solve that um, are, are, are certainly beneficial. So the idea of doing sketching in the least squares sense is, is again pretty simple. You apply some sketching matrix S. So S is this sort of R by N matrix, so R is much, much smaller than N. And then you, um, you're going to do your least squares, but now on your sketch data. So you have SX and SY, so now SX is R by P and uh, SY is just an R-dimensional uh, vector. And you're going to get an estimator that's kind of you know, based on minimizing this, this least squares problem. OK, and so the, the, kind of the computational complexity of this is order of RP squared plus whatever computation was involved in getting that sketch. So if you can, can come up with a computationally efficient way to get that sketch, then you can potentially, you know, do, you can potentially save a lot of computation by doing this. And, um, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about what are reasonable choices for sketching matrices later. Um, but the idea is, is that you, in some sense, want your beta, beta S to be a reasonably good approximation to beta, beta OLS under some metrics. And I'll talk about you know, what metrics you use and sort of how the choice of the metrics is, is really important. <coughs> okay. um, so this is sort of the prior work and you know, what was basically saying that you know, sketching works really well. So this is kind of work by Dronaeus and Mahoney back in 2011, um, which, which basically supported the idea of doing sketching for, um, for least squares was basically, you know, you're gaining, you're gaining a lot and not losing much from an, from an accuracy perspective. So basically what you assume is you assume that y, um, is y, y and x are fixed and, you know, that they can be whatever, whatever they are. And what a, a reasonable way of measuring, um, you know, how how much you lose by by doing your um, by by by, uh, by doing your sketching is you kind of compare these kind of residual um, mean squared errors. So you know, y minus x beta s squared divided by sort of the original uh, sort of the accuracy of the original OLS estimator. 
And here, uh, you know, to make it worst case, I'm taking a supremum over y. You can all equivalently, I mean, a, a question you might have is why not take a supremum over x as well? And for most of the results I talk about, you can apply that, but there's going to be one result where it gets a little bit complicated. But so essentially, you can assume that it's just sort of any any worst case uh, when any, any worst case setup. And what their results show is basically that essentially you get like uh, that this this quantity is only sort of one plus delta worse than the original than the original least squares estimator. So that's why, in some sense, and 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 this was this was for various sketching schemes, and I'll illustrate uh, some of them shortly. Like you know, doing random projections or doing you know sub sampling types of sketching schemes. So this was kind of the computational or algorithmic perspective, which was saying that you are not really losing anything by doing by doing sketching. Okay. All right, and so now, um, so again, like going back to the original goal, like this was something I didn't get when I sort of saw these results. Like, how can you, you know? throw away a lot of your data. So R is much, much smaller than N. So you would think that you're, you know, you would, you would be losing by taking sort of only on like a fraction of R on N sample. So you must be losing something. And yet you would, according to these results, not really losing anything. So up to constant, you're doing just as well as you were before. And so this was something I sort of wasn't, wasn't really understanding. So I'm used to sort of thinking about things typically. Question? Was there any condition on N and P in the previous result? Yes. So the condition. So the condition. The only condition you need is that the um, yeah. So the del, the R has to be bigger than like p log p. So that was the, that. Yeah. So that that's the only result you need is that R has to be bigger than p log p. So you kind of like you're getting enough of the of the rows so that you're you're getting most of it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so. So the way I'm sort of used to thinking about things, and this is really the, the way it's, you know, a, statistical, a, a statistics person would sort of think about things typically, is that when you're trying to solve least squares, this comes from some underlying generated, generative model. So like a, a typical, like, you know, a Gaussian linear model. So you have this, you know, the simple Gaussian linear model where you have some true parameter beta, uh, and then you're adding some noise, which, you know, we're assuming for simplicity is isotropic, but that's sort of a fairly easy assumption to relax. So you're adding zero mean noise that's isotropic. Um, and then uh, there's a, a number of different metrics you can choose. And I'm going to talk about two particular metrics here. One, and you know, in, in statistics here, typically, you're, you're often used to talking about efficiency when you're comparing estimators. So you can think of your sketched least squares um, solution as an estimator, and then your orig original OLS um, solution as an estimator too. And so one, the, the, this first metric, which looks quite similar to the original one, is this so-called residual efficiency, which is just kind of comparing the residuals. But the difference is you're, you're now taking an expectation. And this expectation is being taken over the noise epsilon. So you're taking an expectation over the noise epsilon. And this is how you're kind of comparing these two estimators. But the second one, which is often what statisticians are more, more interested in, is the so-called prediction efficiency. So we're used to talking about prediction error, which is like x beta hat minus x beta, where beta is the true parameter. And, um, and we're going to sort of talk, and, and this is the, the second metric we're going we're gonna to see. And, and we'll see that there's, there's going to be a very important dis distinction between these two, these two metrics. And so ideally, you want to determine good sketching schemes that sort of you know, do well in terms of all three of these, these criteria. But uh, you know, the, these two are really statistical types of criteria. And then the original. Um, what, what I presented on the previous slide was a, you know, an algorithmic uh, or a computational criteria. OK, so now I'll talk a little bit about what sketching schemes are actually typically used in practice. And so there's a number that you know, are, are widely used. So essentially, there's two classes of sketching that are, I would say, very common. They're, they're, they're both based on kind of randomization. There are also some deterministic sketching schemes that are suggested, but computationally, Randomized sketching schemes generally work well. So one's based on sampling, and in particular, I'll talk about what leverage score sampling is uh, shortly. Um, but you know, sam trying to sample in in a in a way that's that's random. So you could think about sampling rows or columns, or doing something more clever than that. And the other sort of approach that that's widely used is random projection. So you can imagine if your S is you know a random Gaussian or Bernoulli matrix, and just sort of do a projection onto 
uh, you know, using that. And then there's also a Hadamard projection. That's a, that's a different kind of projection. But essentially, there's two classes of ske randomized sketching that are widely used. And I'll be f sort of focusing on these classes of sketching, either doing sort of sampling or doing, um, doing projection. OK, so just I mentioned this notion of leverage score sampling. So this is uh, something that sort of gained, particularly by Michael Mahoney and others, gained a lot of sort of traction in the last maybe sort of five years or so in the theoretical computer science and machine learning literature. Um, and so what leverage score, so, so when you're thinking about sampling kind of your, your X's and your Y's, I mean, the natural choice or thing to do would be just to sample uniformly. And we'll, that, that works OK, but um, like essentially, and we'll see this with some simulations later too, um, if you can do sampling in a, in a more potentially clever way or more efficient way that picks the samples that you know, do best in terms of mean squared error, you can potentially you know, you know, do, do more with less samples. And so <laughs> one way to do this that's, that's sort of been shown is to pick the samples that have what are known as high leverage scores. So to explain high leverage scores, so you, know, there's, you can think about the singular value decomposition of x, so that's u sigma v transpose. And the points that are so-called like have high leverage score, if you imagine that you, know, you have your, um, you know, your U matrix, which is essentially the, the row singular vectors, and if you take the two norm of, these, um, of the rows of these singular vectors, then um, these are what are so-called the leverage scores. And these are numbers between 0 and 1, such that the sum of these n leverage scores add up to p. Um, and in some sense, the idea of leverage score sampling is that you pick the the rows that have the highest leverage scores, okay, and so, and and and, and so this is this is sort of a typical. You know, the, 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 it's been shown that if the, the points with high leverage in some sense are best in terms of kind of reducing uh, the 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 mean squared error that we've talked about, and we'll see that in simulations that tend they tend to to work pretty well. And I guess on another sort of note that this is kind of a quick diversion from what I'm talking about, but it's also it's also related is that. In general, this concept of leverage scores and points with high leverage of like that actually goes back to some work in the robust statistics uh, community in the 50s and 60s. And in fact, like if you so if you present this idea of present of uh, sampling points with high leverage score to a statistics community, they'll often say that that's sort of a really like not a not a smart thing to do at all. And the reason for that is because in some sense, typically points with high leverage. Uh, Reflect, um, you know, reflect points that may be outliers, and so, in some sense, like this, and and I, and and so, this is being proposed as a scheme to include points that have that reduce your mean squared error. But a statistician might often say that you're picking those points because they have because they're sort of outliers, and so this again it also illustrates maybe a different perspective in terms of how a statistician might look at high leverage points and someone in sort of numerical linear algebra or computer science because. In some sense, the high leverage points are best in terms of reducing mean squared error because they, if, if, if you view your least squares problems as having like no noise and no outliers, then those, those points are the ones that in some sense contain the most information. And so they skew your, your mean squared error estimate, uh, your, your uh, ordinary least squares estimate the most. But on the other hand, if, if what you're fitting is instead the fact that they're outliers or noise, which is what typically people in statistics care about, then you're essentially just you know, biasing your, your estimator in completely the wrong way. So that's sort of a side note as to you know, another sort of difference in perspective. But for now, I'm kind of, and so, 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 but for now, I'm focusing on the fact that you know, these, in some sense, your model's right, which is you know, obviously a very strong assumption. But you know, we, you know, that, that, um, the, and so we're fitting these, we're picking these high leverage points because they reduce the overall mean squared error. OK. Um, any questions at this point? And so an, a, a natural question you might sort of have related to this is that, you know, our original goal was to reduce the computation of ordinary least squares. And in some sense, to get these leverage scores, which we're going to use for sampling, we had to compute an SVD, which is the same computation as ordinary least squares. So, you know, why are we doing this and are we gaining anything? And so there is some, you know, there's some other work that's, you know, done by Jonaeus and Mahoney and others that shows that you can actually compute these leverage scores, like not the exact leverage scores, but approximate leverage scores fairly, efficient, fairly efficiently. So with a computation of order of NP, so you can potentially do this computation fairly efficiently as well. So that's why 
you know, do it, like doing this computation isn't sort of a, you know, you're not just, you know, do it solving the original pro like it's something that's as hard as the original. Can you do this uh, sampling-based caching, um, like in uh, online fashion, or uh, you have to store all your data and then pick the rows you're going to, uh, to, to keep? Um, yeah, so that's a good question. I, I, don't, I don't know of any scheme that allows you to do online because to compute the leverage... Something you can. I mean, Sorry? If you, just, if you just do a... Yeah. Thing, you can. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that's one of the... Yeah, I agree. So that's one of the potential weaknesses that if you... Doing this in an online way, I don't think there's been any work on that. And I don't know how you'd do that because you sort of need to know all of the, all of the rows, yeah. Okay, so... Um, I guess I'm sort of building up to the, you know, the the goal was to sort of explain these two different uh, these two different perspectives, uh, and so just uh, to uh, to sort of build up to that, there's a slide that, um, uh, in some sense, talks about how you can relate the uh, the like how these two metrics perform uh, or how these three metrics perform in terms of you know properties of the simple projection matrix. So typically, when you're when you're solving ordinary least squares, and recall that we had the SVD of uh, X on the previous slide. If you're just solving least squares, that's just a projection on. It's projecting Y onto the row space of, of X. And so, what uh, if we do sketching? Then what you're doing is rather than doing a projection onto the row space of, of X, you're kind of doing a projection on using this sort of oblique oblique projection matrix. So this is a projection matrix. So you know, if you square it, you'll get back what you what you had originally. But then you know it's not it's it's oblique in the sense that it's not it, you you can't like uh, if you take a transpose it's not the same thing, and so um, this so you can relate it to quantities that involve this uh, this oblique projection matrix and I guess the main thing to take away from this is that if you look at these last two statistical metrics then in some sense that um, you can see that you know up to constant that this prediction efficiency kind of scales like n over p times the residual efficiency. And that in a nutshell is ex ex explains kind of the difference between you know, these two perspectives and you know, why you potentially will do very well in terms of worst case efficiency and residual efficiency, but not so well in terms of prediction efficiency, which, what, which is what kind of statisticians would potentially be most interested in. And so this is, I guess, the, the main result and probably the one thing that you should sort of take most away from uh, from this talk, if we look at a comparison of, of these results, and so um, remember that P is kind of the low dimension of your, of your least squares, R is the number of rows that you've sketched, and N is kind of the big dimension or the number of samples that you have. Um, if we look at, uh, and these are three particular uh, sketching schemes, so SR stands for kind of leverage scores, you know, with like, I guess that that's, that's with some sort of correction for the bias. SGP is kind of a Gaussian or sub-Gaussian type projection, and then HAD is just a Hadamard projection. Um, but for all of these sketching schemes, you see that for the worst case and for the residual error, we see that we get kind of a 1 plus a P over R term. So as long as like, you know, R is a little bit bigger than P, which is, you know, like P log P relating to what uh, uh, Simone asked, um, then you can see that you get the performance guarantees like what um, you know, Dranais and Mahoney were getting earlier. But then if you look at the prediction efficiency, you get something that's very different, which kind of means that it, which is consistent with what, you know, my sort of intuition was initially that you're like, you need R to be of order N to even get close in terms of performance uh, according to this, uh, according to this metric, which is what statisticians typically care about. So in some sense, sketching isn't really helping you in any reasonable way. Um, if you kind of are looking at this prediction efficiency metric. So even though it works well from a worst case perspective, it's not working well at all in terms of, uh, in terms of prediction efficiency. But do you have lower bounds? Or? Uh, that's, I'm getting to that on the last slide, yeah. That's a good question, yeah. Okay, so, so this is, uh, yeah, so as pointed out, these are just upper bounds on these sketching schemes. Like, are there lower bounds? And yeah, like, there are, and I'll, I'll talk about those. Yep. Is it possible to remove the expectations in the ratios? Um, so, you, and get high probability results? Um, I suspect that it probably is. I, I, we haven't done that, but I, so it made the analysis easier to not do that, but I think you can probably get away with that, yeah. Do you think it could change the magnitude of the last uh, rebound? Um, 
to like you mean to like it is because it is a racial expectation and uh oh, you, do you think it would change to something better than n over r so i guess our lower so we've got i'll talk about lower bounds at the end that suggest that you can't really do better than that um uh, unless unless you have very specialized cases and i'll talk about that um on the next slide but yeah in general in general you can't really do better than that yeah Okay, and so this is like just a different um, upper bound, and, and this is for a particular sketching scheme that I guess is not traditionally used by in, in the sketching literature. But th this, I guess, is um, it, it's uh, it's trying to take advantage of the fact that you potentially have leverage score distributions that you can you can take advantage of and exploit, um, and you know it, it also supports some of the the simulation results I'll show, and it shows that you can potentially do better in terms of the statistical leverage scores. If you do this leverage score sketching without doing a kind of correction for bias, um, and so you get the k, the k here is typically going to be less than n because it's taking the largest uh, and like the largest k leverage scores, and so you're going to potentially do better using the sketching scheme, but it's under this very very strong assumption. Okay, and just to show some simulations uh, to to sort of compare uh, these different sketching schemes and also to compare the uh, the different uh, the different metrics. So there's going to be six different sketching schemes I use. The first four uh, are related to um, you know sol sampling type approaches that I talked about, and the last uh, the last couple are related to um, to projection type approaches. So what we're doing, and this is not a very large data setting, but I've got some simulations in a in a larger data setting. But here we've got n equals a thousand and p equals fifty, and we vary our um, we are as varied as we'll see from you know around maybe 50 to about to about a thousand because we typically want r to be bigger than p but smaller than n um and we're going to sample x uh uniformly uh, according to we're going to use a multivariate t distribution and the reason for that is because i've talked a bit about leverage score sketching and leverage score sampling and so what what this allows us to do is to allows us to generate x that has different leverage score distributions. So some x that have sort of very uniform leverage scores and some x that don't. So we're going to uh, use t distributions with three different uh, type, three different no, uh, like numbers of degrees of freedom, uh, one, two, and ten degrees of freedom, um, and we're going to compare these six different uh, these six different uh, sampling or sketching schemes. So in particular, just to illustrate sort of why we're using these different distributions, uh, this is a plot of what the leverage scores look like for these three different, uh, these three different values. So in some sense, the, the intuition for this is that if you have nu equals 1, that's a very heavy tail distribution. And so um, that means that you're going to have, in some sense, more non-uniform leverage. So nu equals 1 has a very heavy tail distribution because um, you're kind of dividing. You have fewer degrees of freedom. So in some sense, you're going to have more um, there's, there's going to be um, like a, a there's going to be a less uniform leverage score distribution, which is what you see here. And for nu equals ten, that's kind of getting close to like a normal distribution. And so you have very no, very uh, uniform leverage score. So we're just comparing the performance for different choices of, of x here. And so if we look at uh, sort of these, sorry, that's a bit crowded. But if we look at these six different uh, these six different sketching schemes. Um, so there's a couple, I mean, one of the main points to take out of this and what, um, you know, particularly relating to the results is that look at the scale of this. So this is looking at the algorithmic or computational perspective. If you look at the, the y-axis, you can see that everything's pretty close to one or particularly for the first two cases, everything's kind of fairly close to one. So, you know, this supports the theory that you're kind of within one plus delta if you look at the... Um, Kind of the worst case, uh, the worst case type uh, performance that Drenaeus and Mahoney were dealing with. And then, on the other hand, if you look at the uh, statistical perspective, which is you know what you know the that third metric that I talked about, the prediction efficiency, um, you can see that the y-axis here is substantially larger than one because, in some sense, you're losing in terms of like by by you're losing in terms of efficiency by having um, by having less data to deal with. So this is kind of just showing this, the plots for when we look at these two different metrics. Okay, so um, and 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 so we can see that uh, like injection in general, like sampling schemes and projection projection schemes, you know, both seem to work reasonably well. Um, but 
Uh, but, but in particular, like the reason why I showed that, that second result was that that seems to do the best uh, computationally, even though there's not, not, not much in terms of theory for that. So this was kind of doing these leverage score sketching schemes um, without doing any kind of bias correction. So what is the, the, the green curve? The green curve, that's, just, that's what I guess Dranaeus and Mahoney typically do, which is leverage score sketching, but then they do a bias correction or a rescaling. So that is, in some sense, what, what's typically been proposed and has the most theoretical guarantees, but it doesn't do so well in practice. And the, red? the red is doing that, but without doing the bias correction or rescaling. So that's actually not proposed. The, the reason we do that is because that's not proposed in theory, and there's very little theoretical. So what is rescaling? So typically, like when you do a rescale, so when you're when you're sampling, say, and you take R samples, you typically need to rescale things so that you know you're not um, like so that you in some sense correct for the fact that you have less less by that, that you've got less sample so you might multiply by square root of r over n uh, so to make sure that uh, that everything is sort of considered for, for OLS what, what, what do you multiply so you multiply so so if you if you were to take r samples uniformly yeah. you would need to multiply by square root of r over n to make sure that everything kind of works out and so what this is doing, um, what, but, but for leverage scores, remember, you have to do things a little bit differently because every point has a different leverage score. So instead of dividing by square root of like Rn, like square root of n over r, you do like, like square root of like n over whatever the leverage score is. This is to get the correct expectation. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right, to get the correct expectation. But it, what's interesting is that according to the simulations, you do a lot better if you don't do this correction most, many, many times. And so that... That's sort of why I included this, and that's why we had that second uh, theoretical result because, you know, we wanted to get some theoretical justification for why we were doing so much better in terms of the, the simulations. But I mean, it has to be pointed out also that I think this works very well under this model, but under a model misspecification, it's sort of unclear how well how well this would uh, this would really do. Could you, could you show the previous slide again? Yeah. Okay, so in both, in, for both metric, uh, green is much worse than... Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, for both metrics, green is much worse than, than red in general. But there's, there's more theoretical justification for green than red. Um, and, and in general, like doing sampling, as you might expect, is less stable than doing projections because with projections, you're kind of keeping all of the data but rotating it, whereas for for um for sampling you're kind of losing a lot of your losing a lot of your data and in, in and as you'd expect the performance is also worse for or more unstable for the new equals one which is the the case where you have more like non uniformity in your in your leverage scores again okay, so getting back to to francis's uh, early earlier questions so um this was actually work that was done subsequently by Polanchi and Wainwright. So we suspect that there was a lower bound, but I guess when we were trying to prove it, we discovered that so Polanchi and Wainwright had been working on this sort of independently, and they'd, they've done, they'd done a bunch of other things too. But if, you, if we looked at one of their results, and you know, it wasn't written in this, this way exactly, but in some sense, if you assume that your sketching matrix has this property, so this is for randomized sketching. So to be clear, this expectation is taken over, over S, over the sketching scheme that you're using. And if you kind of assume that it has this property, which is more or less just says that you've got kind of R, R rows in your, in your sketch, if it has this property, then according, like the prediction of efficiency scales no better than N over R, basically. So this suggests that you know, all of those upper bounds that we had cannot really be improved by by using a different sketching scheme, or that you know the analysis was not uh, was not really was not really tight. So this kind of really confirms you know what we what we had what we thought with that um, in fact the um, that this prediction efficiency, which is what you know statisticians are typically thinking about, is um, is is you know an intrinsically harder metric than what was kind of being looked at in the you know in the algorithmic or computational uh, in in the computational setting. And this this was proved kind of using pretty standard information theoretic lower bounding uh, lower bounding techniques. Okay, and so um, so this and and this 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 condition is kind of satisfied for all of the um, all of the S's that we talked about, except for that I guess uh, 
the, uh, the red line here. So for the red line, we saw that we actually got a better result for, um, for, for, uh, for this particular case, and that's because it doesn't satisfy this, uh, it does not kind of satisfy this, this condition, but all of the other um, lines that I plotted basically satisfy this condition. Okay, and so, and, and so the, I guess the work that they did also kind of led, so what, what it's basically saying is that doing one sketch of your data when you do on really squares or even constrained least squares is really not enough if you want to do well in terms of the statistical metric. And so what they kind of proposed is if you do iterative sketching schemes, uh, and this is computationally more intensive because you're taking kind of more and more sketches, um, if you do iterative sketching, then you can potentially sort of get uh, the, the original, you know, like this one plus delta type bound that, that you want, but you have to do kind of iterative sketching. So one sketch sort of isn't enough when you're, when you're doing least squares and you're interested in this, uh, in this prediction efficiency. You don't, is there any beta bound for the 50% uh, probability chart? Sorry? You have, you so that's holding with probability around 50%. 50 yeah. Do you have any, can it be improved? Well, so you can make this 128 bigger and make that half smaller. <laughs> so that's like typically how the, yeah, this works is you kind of, you get it, like there's constants here. And so you get like a one minus delta and then it's like N over like that 128 depends on whatever that probability is. So if you want to make that bigger, you can make this closer to one, I guess. So yeah, that's, that's typically how, yeah. So I mean, these constants are very loose both for the, both for the upper and the lower bounds. So the upper bounds are kind of based on like concentration of measure type arguments and these lower bounds are using information theory techniques, but yeah, the constants are, Really, really loose. Uh, really, really loose here. Okay. Um, any other questions? All right. Um, so, just to sort of conclude and to talk about, like, this is sort of a you know we looked at a very simple problem. So there's a number of ways that uh, that this work uh, can be extended. So, so what this analysis shows is that if we're interested in this, you know, we had these two perspectives. The you know computational algorithmic perspective saying that, you know, doing sketching once does, you know, that preserves most of the information you want to preserve and, and, and does well. But then, you know, we thought like, you know, we came out of thinking that you're losing a lot of your data. And so this was resolved by just the fact that we're in, in some sense looking at different, cri different criteria and different models. And so in terms of um, prediction efficiency, which is what you care about in a statistical setting, um, this is substantially more challenging than the standard kind of algorithmic or, or worst case setting. Um, and then there was this other sort of interesting thing that sort of came up that when you do like this leverage score sampling kind of without correcting for the bias to make the expectation, then it seems to do well from a, from a, a computational, or from, a, from a, a simulation performance perspective. Um, but yeah, I mean, as, as pointed out, there's, and, and you know, relating to some of these questions, there's a, a number of ways that this work can be extended. So um, as pointed out, there's the online case. So this is certainly only works in the, in the batch mode case. A lot of these, uh, a lot of these ideas, but if you potentially did, um, you know, is there, is there a way to kind of extend this to, to the online uh, setting? Um, so this is, and this is kind of the simplest problem that you can look at this on really squares problem. And so what we're looking at right now is when you kind of have like low rank matrices or tensors, like there's this notion of uh, doing sketching to come up with like an approximation to the SVD. And so, and this is called the CUR decomposition. And so we're kind of doing, or, so right now what we're doing is an analysis uh, of, uh, for that. Um, then, um, and there's also a perspective of sketching that's related to regularization, implicit regularization, where kind of exp we're, and we're exploring this, uh, this connection and also looking at whether like sketching can, can in some sense recover like low rank tensor structure. So in general, tensors are more difficult to deal with than, than vectors or, or matrices. And we're seeing if, if sketching can potentially give you kind of computational gains there if you do the sketching in a, in a, you know, in a, in a reasonably sort of clever and, and efficient way. All right, uh, thanks, thanks very much. Okay, so we have time for questions. Is there anyone? Yes. Um, the, so the leverage score sampling, so do you have the results again? Yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, the simulations? Yeah, the simulations. Yeah. And uh, so you had a fast version of one of those leverage? Yeah, 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 exactly. So that's this SSHR. So.
which is uh sorry the pink <laughs> yeah um this is like the analog of the sr one but fast yeah do you have an analog of the snr one which is fast um yeah so that that also does better yeah yeah so so that does better than the sr one which is fast so the SNR one, which is fast, does better than the... Fast means you, you, you estimate the average scores approximately? Yeah, exactly. So we use the, the scheme to estimate the leverage scores approximately. And so you can see you do, what, you do worse than if you knew them exactly. But... So that, that, that scheme does well. Because I, I, I read the paper, but it seemed like they get a proof of something which is how to implement or how to check with it. This was implemented? Yeah, this was implemented. Yeah, yeah. It, it works yeah, reasonably well. Which color is this? That's pink. Um, yeah. Pink. So you compare pink to, to green? To, to yeah, yeah, that's right. So pink, yeah, pink to green, basically. So yeah. pink is better than green? Yeah, yeah. That's, which, which, well, like, and that's probably because of the, the fact that um, you're, like, you're doing some kind of regularization by doing the approximate, and that actually does better, which is interesting, yeah. And could you say the same thing about uh, scaling versus not scaling? The fact that you're not scaling probably acts as a regularization and means that it works better. Yeah, that's the yeah. totally counterintuitive, right? Yeah, no, I agree. I think it is because it is a regularization type argument. Can you write it down in a certain way? Uh, so this was something we tried to do, and I guess that was what this theorem was kind of trying to get at. But okay. we needed to assume something very specific, and so we're trying to do that in a more formal way. But in the so is non-uniform leverage scores to divide by the leverage score. I guess yeah, yeah. this may introduce a lot of variance as well. Exactly. That's exactly right. So that's exactly why it does terribly when you have very non because you're dividing by something that's potentially you're close to. You're doing like importance weights. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Importance weights when the weights when the proper the support distributions are a bit like yeah. Whole, yeah. Whole, yeah, it is it's terrible, yeah, yeah. So that's and yeah, so that's um and I mean like one way that I mean like other people try to overcome that is they'll do like a linear combination of leverage score plus uniform to try to overcome that. But it's still, that seems to still do worse than just not doing any resampling re at all or reweighting at all, yeah. And so there's another technique which is random rotation to make the leverage score uniform and then uniform sampling. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's so completely intractable because there's no way to speed up the random rotation step? I, as, as I understand, that's true, yeah, that doing the random rotation step, yeah. It, that's yeah, that's as I understand, yeah. Uh, you can do that sparse random rotation? <coughs> well, <coughs> I, I guess not. <laughs> uh, it's like compass sensing matrices. There's a limit on how sparse you can make them. So I guess it might be the same issue here. And so the idea of random rotation is that you do random rotation and then leverage. If you do random rotation, then the leverage scores are supposed to be uniform, so you don't care about computing them anymore. And you cannot do random rotation with like given rotations. You can do like very simple random rotation. <laughs> Yeah, I yeah I, I don't know that there's a fast way to do that, but yeah, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. Okay. Is there any other question? Yeah. So, do you think below <coughs> below one is breakable, and uh, how if yes, how far do you think it's possible to go? Uh, maybe under some some assumptions. Ah, uh, so when you say breakable, you mean uh, sorry, like yeah, I say that maybe your number one is, is incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not mine. It's not mine. So <laughs> it's a, yeah, yeah. So it's all right. But like, I mean. Uh, so when you say, uh, yeah. I mean, you said that uh, without the normalization, you do not satisfy the assumption. Yeah, you, so, so yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Just maybe you can go uh, below. Yeah, yeah, so, so certainly, like, yeah, the lower bound is certainly under this assumption. So, yeah, you can potentially, yeah, so how far you can go, like, I guess, for example, like, if you, if you're, if you have a leverage score distribution, which is very, like, non-uniform, then you can see you can get very close to, to kind of, you know, like a part, like a like you can do much much better than lower bound, but um, this again this is under a very restrictive assumption. So basically, like what it's saying is, if all of your leverage score mass is in like p of the of the of the samples, then you can kind of get those p samples, and that takes care of everything. But yeah, is that like often satisfied? Yeah, so that's kind of. Yeah, so it, it depends, I think, on what your what your X matrix is like. But for a general X, I don't know if you can do much better than the lower bound. Okay, other question? Yes. Cool. Uh, what's the quick uh, intuition why SNR doesn't satisfy the assumption? Uh, um, so the intuition is is that 
essentially like if you if you if you have for example like like if you think about an example where p leverage scores have like a leverage score of one and the rest are all zero you could just take all of those p leverage scores and it's like the rest of the rows are zero and so that would like essentially this would um, kind of have a condi like this SS transpose matrix would have a you know very different condition number and because what this is basically saying is that you're effectively getting r r on n fraction of the of the leverage score weight and so if you don't do rescaling you're getting way you're potentially getting way more or way less than that okay so let's thank again uh, thanks